everyone. It is officially 12 o'clock, so I will get started on our welcome uh, <laughs> program here. So uh, we're so glad to have you here today. My name is Shay Corey, and I serve as the programs manager for the DC Preservation League. I'm joined today by our fantastic speaker, Mark Shara, and by Zachary Burt, who is helping to run the Facebook live stream. Uh, for those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are Washington, D.C.'s citywide nonprofit founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of the nation's capital. I have just a few things to go over today before we get started uh, with our lecture. First, I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite free programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Kutak Rock, Douglas Development Corporation, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Robert Benson Photography, Bayer Bender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, Edens, EHT Traceries Inc., KCE Structural Engineers, Quinn Evans, and David Schwartz Architects. Thank you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. Moving on, we have a few notes about how today's webinar is going to run. Uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box that is found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we will go through those questions towards the end of the program. If you're joining us on Facebook, Zach will be collecting those questions. You can just comment them or send them directly to Zach. Uh, and he will send them to us on Zoom. I'd also like to take a moment before we begin to recognize that this March, uh, DCPL is highlighting the loss of historic buildings in the district using James M. Goode's book, Capital Losses, A Cultural History of Washington's Destroyed Buildings as a guide. A uh, longtime DCPL member, Mr. Goode passed away on December 12th, 2019 at 80 years old. This month's programs are sponsored by Amy Ballard, a member of DC's Board of Trustees in memoriam of his life. And with that, I'm so pleased to introduce all of you to today's speaker, Mark Shara, who received his undergraduate degree in architecture from the University of Michigan and his graduate degrees in architecture and architectural history from the University of Virginia. Since 1991, he's been an architect with the Historic American Buildings Survey Division of the National Park Service. Uh, he has supervised the documentation of more than 275 buildings, structures, and sites across the United States. So with that, Mark, I will turn things over to you. Okay. Um, I'll stop sharing. And I need to start sharing. Yes. Uh, is that working? I hope. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, I would like to start by thanking Shay and Zach and Rebecca and everybody at DCPL for the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, as Shay noted, uh, the theme this month of DCPL is capital losses, uh, based on the uh, important book by the late James Good. Uh, Good made uh, extensive use of the Habs collection for a number of his entries, so I think it's uh, appropriate uh, for um, Habs to have a contribution to this month's theme. Um, let's see. I need to. There we go. Uh, so uh, as Shay mentioned, uh, I work for a program called the Historic American Building Survey. It's uh, run by the National Park Service. At HABS, uh, we do architectural documentation. We do three kinds of documentation, uh, architectural measure drawings, large format archival photography, and uh, historical reports. Uh, I'd like to actually start with a little bit of a timeline. Um, so uh, the year is 1933, it is the height of the Great Depression. Uh, millions of Americans are out of work, including thousands of architects. Uh, so the Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just been inaugurated earlier that year and the Roosevelt administration was looking for ways to put people to work. And they finally decided the, the easiest and most direct way to put people to work was for the federal government to hire them. And so they created a program called the Civil Works Administration, the CWA. And uh, they asked uh, government agencies to make proposals to hire uh, out of work Americans. At the time, there was uh, a young architect named Charles Peterson. Uh, you can see this picture over here uh, in the Washington Post. Uh, he was working down at the uh, uh, battlefield at Yorktown, Virginia. And of course, Yorktown, uh, it's near Jamestown, it's near Williamsburg, the site of the oldest European settlement in the original 13 colonies. Uh, 
and he saw that uh, important historic buildings were being lost left and right. You know, the buildings were being demolished. They were being uh, allowed to uh, fall into ruin. And, you know, there were all these uh, architects out of work. So he had this idea, well, what if we hire architects to do drawings of these buildings and at least uh, there would a record of those that survived. Uh, he sat down and wrote a memo, uh, as you can see on 13th of November, within two weeks, uh, it had been approved by uh, Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes. Uh, by the middle of December, the Habs National Office was up and running in Washington, DC. And on January 2nd, 1934, uh, teams of architects were out in the field across the United States. Um, so uh, one organization that was very interested in the HABS program was the American Institute of Architects because so many of their members were out of work. And so uh, the AIA jumped on board with the HABS program right from the beginning. And HABS was set up uh, in a system that kind of paralleled uh, the system that the AIA had of different state chapters across the country. So in the beginning, there were 39 separate HABS teams uh, all across the country. Um, <laughs> Each of them, uh, they had uh, the person in charge of the team who um, was uh, an important local AIA architect. Um, they were known as the district officers. Uh, here's some photos of some of the early HABS teams out in the field. And again, uh, some photos of some of the uh, HABS teams in their offices. Um, so uh, returning uh, to our timeline, as I mentioned, 1934, uh, the Civil Works Administration was up and running. Uh, uh, DC was one of the sites of the original HABS teams. Uh, the district officer was a man named Henry Brooks Price. Uh, he actually had been a successful architect in New York City for many years and had only recently moved to DC. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how he was appointed as district officer, but nonetheless, he uh, ran the first Habs team. Uh, at, at the same time in 1934, there was a man named Lester Holland. Uh, Holland actually wore two hats. He was an architect. He was actually the head of the AIA Historic Resources Committee, uh, which was a national committee interested in historic architecture. Uh, but his day job, he worked at the Library of Congress in what is today the Prince and Photographs Division. And he had been trying to put together a uh, collection of um, uh, photographs and drawings of historic American buildings. And so when he heard about the establishment of Habs, this was his dream come true. And he engineered the signing of an agreement called the Habs Tripartite Agreement between the three entities you see there. So the National Park Service agreed to run the HABS program. The American Institute of Architects agreed to provide professional oversight and the Library of Congress agreed to archive the collection and make it uh, available to the public. And uh, we still operate today under this 1934 agreement. Uh, also in 1934, uh, Congress passed a law called the Historic Sites Act. And there was specific language in the law, which you see there, uh, which actually sort of authorized what HABS was doing. So in fact, uh, it, um, Congress is saying that what HABS does is uh, a legitimate role of the federal government. So uh, the original Civil Works Authority was actually only funded for the first four months of 1934. But as we all know, the depression uh, continued. And so uh, in 1935, Congress created a new program called the Works Progress Administration or the WPA. Uh, and uh, HABS was moved underneath the WPA. The WPA was a lot of different programs doing a lot of different things, but uh, HABS was one of them. And so in uh, 1936 and 37, there was a second HABS team here in DC uh, the district officer was Della Smith, uh, another prominent uh, DC architect. Uh, it's not my intention to make this uh, presentation all about me, but um, I would just point uh, people, anyone who's interested in learning more about uh, HABs in DC in the 1930s, I would uh, point them to this article, which was I wrote, which was recently in uh, Washington History Magazine. 
so uh, while researching that article, um, uh, I was trying to determine how did Habs, the have scenes of the 1930s choose the sites they chose to document. And unfortunately, I could find no, uh, no memos or letters or lists or anything. Um, but uh, the original uh, HABS teams were mandated by the National HABS office uh, that one of their priorities should be buildings that were endangered and th or threatened. So I'd like to think that, for example, uh, with this building here, the Hamburg House, um, uh, which was documented by HABS in 1934 and uh, demolished within a year, the Habs team knew that this uh, site was threatened. So uh, Hamburg was a, uh, established by um, a group of German settlers in what today is Foggy Bottom in 1765. And in 1934, it was thought that this house was the last and only surviving house from the original Hamburg settlement. Um, there's some uh, contention over that. I, I won't go into it. But nonetheless, it was a rare example, early surviving house, um, gable front, amber roof, wood frame, little, uh, very modest uh, vernacular house. And uh, it was documented by Habs. Uh, you can see today the site is occupied by a park that has a general on a horse on a pedestal of which we know there are uh, a number of those here in DC. Um, uh, another uh, building document by the, the 1930s uh, Habs teams was uh, this, again, a very modest wood frame row house on Capitol Hill, uh, three stories in height, uh, one room in front, one room for room in back on each of three floors. Uh, the interesting aspect of the house was the uh, front elevation, the wood siding was beveled and then painted with a paint mixed with sand to make it look like stone. Uh, and this was actually a technique used at Mount Vernon. Um, so uh, again, uh, this house was demolished within a year after it was documented for a parking garage for the House of Representatives. So uh, I'd like to think the Habsteins were aware of this situation. Um, uh, another, uh, I think, important early site was the Anton Rupert House at uh, New York Avenue and Lanesburg Road. Um, back in 1935, you can see it looked like it was out in the country, uh, as you can see today. Uh, I think we all know what uh, the intersection of New York Avenue and Lanesburg Road looks like. Uh, I think the house is actually located right here where the Kentucky Fried Chicken and Taco Bell uh, is nonetheless obviously the Habs uh, architects realized this was a rare surviving example of a wood frame uh, country house, uh, country farmhouse. Um, Anton Rupert uh, bought the house in 1860 and uh, it, uh, if you're familiar with DC history, you know the Rupert family has had a long uh, in, uh, role as uh, in various commercial er enterprises here in the city. Rupert was actually a butcher, and on the site he built two uh, brick ice houses where he could uh, store his meat. Um, of course, everything on this site was was demolished in 1938. Uh, one. Other interesting aspect of this site is the photo you see on the left. Uh, I earlier showed some photos of some of the early Habs teams. Uh, I have not been able to find any photo of any of the DC Habs teams. And this is in fact the only photo from DC in the 1930s, which shows a team member. Uh, the man standing on the porch, his name was Frederick Nichols. Um, he was a young architect from Yale. And he was actually working at the National uh, Habs office, but clearly uh, the guys in the National office would help out the local guys as needed. Um, just as an aside, so uh, Nichols went on to a long and distinguished career as a professor at the University of Virginia. He was one of the people to found the graduate program on architectural history, which was the first in the country. Uh, I actually attended the program in the early 1980s, 
at which point uh, uh, Freddie Nichols had retired, but he was still teaching his uh, signature class on the architecture of Thomas Jefferson. So I had the opportunity to uh, take that course from him. Uh, I wish I had known at the time of his, uh, um, um, that he was one of the early Habs guys, but um, anyways. Um, I'll show one more site from uh, the 1930s, uh, the John R. McLean house. This occupied uh, the entire length of the block of I Street on the south side of McPherson Square. Uh, this house was essentially uh, the Downton Abbey of McPherson Square. Um, the McLeans were uh, incredibly wealthy. Uh, they were famous for their uh, uh, um, throwing lavish parties. Um, they had another house on Wisconsin Avenue called McLean Gardens, and the town of McLean, Virginia was named after John McLean. Uh, anyways, his house was built in 1907 and designed by John Russell Pope, who would go on to become uh, perhaps the most important uh, Beaux-Arts architect in the United States in the early 20th century. Uh, here in DC, he did the National Archives, the National Gallery of Art, the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, Anyways, uh, what, what's kind of interesting to me here is the, the Habs teams of the 1930s were given a general cutoff date of 1860, which is that they should look at buildings that predated the Civil War. So uh, this building, when it was demolished in 1939, was only 32 years old. Um, but again, uh, our friend Freddie Nichols, who we saw in the, in the previous uh, slide, he uh, had the wherewithal to take a series of photographs of this house uh, before it was demolished. So uh, um, obviously the, um, the, you know, the Habs, are, early Habs architects had a vision beyond uh, the confines of just doing uh, early American stuff. Um, and uh, of course, um, if you, when you look through the, um, Habs photos from the 1930s, you not only uh, discover the buildings that they were photographing, but they, you know, I, what I enjoy is they inadvertently captured uh, aspects of everyday life. Uh, so, of course, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal is still here and it's been preserved. But you can see in the 30s on the left how overgrown the um, towpath had become. There's even a, a little shack built on this side. And I especially like the photo on the right showing the towpath being used as a parking lot, which um, thankfully is no longer the case today. Uh, but anyways, uh, to proceed with our story, um, uh, World War One, I'm uh, sorry, World War II, of course, broke out in 1941. Uh, Congress abolished uh, the WPA so the nation could focus its efforts on winning the war. <clears throat> Charles Peterson, who I mentioned earlier, had been with the National Habs office all through the 30s. Uh, he served in the Navy during the war, <clears throat> came back uh, to work for the Park Service this time in Philadelphia. So uh, he tried to keep the Habs program going. Uh, mainly, uh, he was do little projects around Philadelphia uh, and in, in the Northeast region where he was centered. Um, but for the most part, it was uh, pretty much dormant as a national program <laughs> through the 1950s and early into the early 1960s. Um, but, uh, and meanwhile, here in DC, what I'd like to look at is uh, what I'm referring to as um, four episodes of mass demolition that came after World War II. Uh, and the first of these was the redevelopment of Southwest. Um, I think many people are familiar with the story. Uh, after World War II, Congress created the Urban Renewal Program. Um, they decided they needed a, a case study here in DC. Uh, Southwest DC, which was one of the oldest and most historic neighborhoods in DC, had become uh, predominantly African-American. So the powers that be decided it was a slum and needed to be removed. In, in 1946, Congress created uh, an uh, agency called the Redevelopment Land Agency, the RLA. 
They were given eminent domain authority. Uh, 23,000 people were evicted and about 500 acres were cleared uh, to create the new Southwest. Uh, these, the second of these uh, episodes of mass demolition was that I, I'd like to talk about is the construction of the interstate highway system. Um, you can see on the lower right, there's a plan. This is from 1971. <clears throat> the beltway has been completed but the highway planners uh, want, are taking I-95 and they want to bring it all the way in through the district, you know, uh, blast their way through, come out the other side, have a branch that goes out this way. And here's I-66, they want to barrel that in all the way across downtown to meet up with I-95. I mean, um, if they had had their way, it would have in, involved an enormous amount of demolition. Uh, so Southwest had already been cleared, and you can see here the beginnings of the construction of uh, 395. So it's easy to bring what today is 395 in to about uh, South Capitol Street. But once they started uh, you know, publicizing these plans uh, to bring it through the city that would have involved extensive demolition, uh, the residents rose up and fought it. And eventually, for the most part, and thank goodness uh, these plans were defeated. However, uh, the extension through Southeast was built. Uh, what's today 695, the Southeast Freeway. Um, anyways, uh, looking at Southwest, the uh, HABS team in the 1930s had documented a number of sites in Southwest. And I think what's actually quite interesting uh, uh, in the 1930s, they recognized these four buildings as particularly important architecturally and historically. And in fact, the planners of the 1950s also came to the same conclusion. So these four buildings were actually spared from demolition during um, the, uh, the clearing of Southwest. But again, what you see captured in some of the Habs photographs from the 1930s are the contexts in which this building sat. So you can see, for instance, the Duncanson Cranch House was uh, embraced by these uh, standard DC Victorian row houses on either side, and those are long gone. Um, otherwise, um, there is a small collection of, so four buildings were photographed in 1958 by uh, a photographer named Victor Amato. And I don't know um, the, the, um, why this happened. Uh, Cause as I mentioned, Habs was pretty much dormant during this time. Uh, so there was no attempt to comprehensively document what was lost, but we do have uh, these, four images uh, in the Habs collection from Southwest. Uh, likewise, uh, where the Southeast Freeway was built, uh, basically paralleled Virginia Avenue on the, on the south side of um, Capitol Hill, uh, there was a collection of photos by a photographer named Russell Jones. And again, I don't know the circumstances that these were taken or came into the Habs collection. Uh, probably the most significant building that was demolished as part of the construction of the Southeast Freeway was the old Masonic Temple at Virginia and Fifth Southeast. Uh, the nice Gothic Revival building uh, constructed by the uh, Naval Lodge in 1821. The Naval Lodge later moved to Fourth and Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast in a building where there, they still exist today. Uh, this building became a school, but then uh, demolished for the highway in 1963. So uh, moving along, uh, I'd like to talk about two more episodes of mass demolition. Uh, there's a, a famous DC anecdote where uh, President Kennedy was traveling up uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in 1961 on his inauguration. And he decided that it was looking kind of shabby. Or in his uh, exact words, it was a state of diminished elegance. Uh, of course, uh, Kennedy was uh, uh, sadly assassinated in 63, but uh, his widow, Jackie Kennedy, asked Lyndon Johnson that as a memorial to John F. Kennedy to basically um, you know, 
do something about Pennsylvania Avenue. So in 65, um, uh, Lyndon Johnson created the President's Commission on Pennsylvania Avenue, and this later evolved into a, a full-fledged government agency, the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation. Uh, and PADC, like uh, the RLA before it, was given eminent domain authority. Uh, and here you see it, one of the early plans for Pennsylvania Avenue. And PADC had authority over uh, both sides of the avenue and then the area of old downtown, uh, in some cases as far north as F Street. And basically what PADC proposed was uh, a, a removing the small scale uh, late 19th, early 20th century um, commercial buildings and replacing them with big office blocks and in some cases uh, hotels or apartments. And uh, this is more or less essentially what happened. Um, so here you can see, uh, this is from a slightly later uh, PADC document looking at this particular block, here's the existing condition. Again, a, a number of small uh, um, uh, little commercial buildings and what PADC is proposing is uh, this giant office block to replace all these buildings. I'll also point out as a little anecdote, as you can see in this plan uh, right here is the location of the old post office but now the uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And this plan proposed demolishing the post office except for the tower, which you see poking up here. Well, a group of citizens organized uh, to uh, uh, fight the demolition of the old post office. They uh, called themselves Don't Tear It Down. And of course, as we know, Don't Tear It Down has evolved into the DC Preservation League. So uh, was in, in reaction to the partly to the PADC that uh, uh, DCPL owns its origin. And of course they were successful in preserving the post office. And then the fourth episode I'd like to talk about briefly was the uh, construction of the Washington Convention Center completed in 1982. Uh, but uh, there's one big difference between these two uh, undertakings and the two previous ones I, I spoke about. And that is by the middle of the 60s, uh, there were historic preservation laws in place. Uh, specifically in 1966, Congress passed the National uh, Historic Preservation Act. Uh, this act did a number of things. And I should mention this act was partly in response to the demolitions that occurred through urban renewal and through the construction of the interstate highway system. But among other things, the Preservation Act, uh, it, it established the State Historic Preservation Offices, uh, established the National Register of Historic Places. In terms of HABs, it, it reorganized the HABs program and brought it to DC and made it a national program again. And in addition, there was a clause in this act called Section 106. Uh, and what Section 106 basically said is that, uh, you're gonna do something to an historic building and it's gonna have an adverse impact and there's federal government money involved, you need to mitigate that impact. And that mitigation uh, often it takes the form of HABS documentation. And then of course in 73, DC uh, received home rule and five years later, they passed one of the strongest historic preservation acts in the country. Uh, but looking at, um, PADC. Um, uh, this is the Muncie building on the 1300 block of E Street, designed by McKimmead and White, uh, arguably the preeminent architecture firm of the day in, in the early 20th century. Again, from that same uh, planning document, here's the existing condition. The Muncie building is here, and here's what PADC is proposing. Uh, and, and you can see that uh, the Muncie building got replaced by this giant uh, Marriott Hotel. Uh, the building right here is the National Theater, which was also shown to be replaced, but somehow the National Theater survived. Uh, anyways, uh, because of the preservation laws that were in place, uh, it was necessary to document the Muncie building before it was demolished. Uh, 
Most of the uh, documentation that occurred for PADC involved photography and short historical uh, reports. Um, <clears throat> I think the Muncie building was important enough that it also had measure drawings done. Uh, you, I can see this interesting plan. Um, on the left is the, the ground floor banking hall. On the right, you see the plan. It was E-shaped. Uh, the front facade is right here along E Street. Um, so uh, <clears throat> at the time, electric light was still relatively new. And so office buildings needed to make sure that every office was provided with a window. So you uh, see the various light wells uh, that uh, go down so that these offices all have uh, access to daylight. Uh, of course, the planners of the 60s thought this was an incredible amount of wasted space and uh, the building was demolished. Um, I'll talk about just a couple more buildings. This was the... <laughs> Occidental Hotel and Restaurant, uh, again, on the 1400 block of Pennsylvania, right next to the Willard Hotel. Now the Willard Hotel, as we know, was preserved and uh, carefully restored. And in fact, the uh, PADC plan shows the Willard uh, surviving and being restored, but right here is the Occidental. Uh, the Occidental uh, did not survive and was demolished. Uh, Lowe's Palace Theater on the 1300 block of F Street. Uh, this was designed by Thomas Lamb. Uh, Lamb uh, was uh, a, a prolific designer of movie theaters. He designed over 100 across the United States, uh, including several here in DC. Uh, um, you might also, if you uh, look at James Good's book, The Translux Theater, which was an Art Deco gem on 14th of Pennsylvania was also by Thomas Lamb. Uh, <clears throat> you can see today there's a, a Starbucks and a couple empty storefronts where um, Los Palace Theater was. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned, basically what PADC proposed, the demolition of all these small scale buildings is what happened. Uh, this is just a collection of, uh, I just chose four uh, what I thought were particularly attractive uh, late 19th century commercial buildings, each of them four stories, uh, all of them are gone. Uh, and then a couple of 20th, early 20th century buildings. Uh, I think it's interesting, the three buildings on the right were all by the same architecture firm, Marsh and Peter, <laughs> built within four years of one another. And they're basically about the same size and, and the same massing, just had a, a variety of facade treatments. Uh, some of us are also old enough to remember uh, Raleigh's Men's Store, which was a DC institution for many years. Um, and again, uh, just I just pulled together a couple of random photographs of some of the buildings that uh, were in the uh, old downtown area that are no longer standing. Um, uh, uh, and even uh, some modernist buildings have infiltrated old downtown. Um, I'm kind of intrigued by this Jordan's Piano Company building. This is on the site of uh, the Macy's store today, which was originally built as a hack store, uh, uh, we have this uh, nice uh, curtain wall facade put up over two 1860s buildings. And, the, and here the Federal Triangle building, which was not even 25 years old uh, when it was demolished. Uh, uh, admittedly, not a particularly attractive building. So I don't know if many people uh, actually missed that one. Uh, one thing that surprised me looking through all this HABS documentation was uh, to what extent the automobile had already permeated the old area of downtown. Uh, this was the Ford Motor Company showroom right on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's where the uh, Canadian Embassy is now located, designed by Albert Kahn of Detroit, who was the leading industrial architect in the United States in the early 20th century. Uh, and in, in my opinion, uh, you know, a handsome building. Uh, this is the showroom, this space in here, uh, quite nice. But, um, you know, elsewhere in downtown, uh, there had already been a proliferation of uh, little parking garages. 
So clearly there had already been an earlier wave of demolition in order to um, accommodate uh, uh, parking. Uh, in fact, like this garage here by Appleton v. Clark uh, was built in 1918, uh, rather early. So um, I should also mention um, the time of the PADC redevelopment is also when Metro is being constructed. So, so uh, at the same time they're building these big new office buildings, there's a new way to bring people downtown, uh, especially office workers from the suburbs. Um, Anyways, I, I'm sure uh, most people don't miss the various parking garages in the old downtown. Um, and uh, those of us who are familiar with the history of preservation in DC uh, know that uh, DC became the leader in uh, preserving uh, building facades. So not everything PADC did was complete demolition. In some cases, they save the facade, uh, what's in a process known as facadism, or some people call it facademy. But uh, this is one of the earlier examples, uh, Gilman's Drugstore at uh, uh, right up Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, so uh, uh, again, the facades were saved and actually preserved. And, and in fact, the uh, this nice wooden cornice was reconstructed on these buildings, but the interiors were uh, demolished and um, uh, James Good mentions this in his book, and he describes it as the finest surviving 19th century commercial interior in DC uh, before it was uh, demolished in 1967. <laughs> really a beautiful space in the former Gilman's drugstore. Uh, just another couple other quick examples. Um, the Central Armature Works was a rare example of uh, an industrial building downtown. Uh, it had this, uh, on, you know, this great open space with these uh, metal sash windows all around. Uh, again, uh, the building was demolished. The facade was preserved. Uh, to me, it just looks a little bit forlorn, but uh, uh, for better or worse, that uh, uh, passed as preservation. And one last example I'll talk about, uh, and uh, I'll admit I had a small role in this project. Uh, this is uh, Whitlow's, which was a well-known restaurant at uh, um, uh, 11th and E Street, so uh, Northwest, right in the heart of downtown. Uh, you can see for this development, a number of facades were, were preserved, uh, including the Whitlow's facade. Um, but of course, um, the interior was lost. <laughs> uh, you can see in, uh, that this, uh, uh, the, the upper levels have been converted to apartments. Uh, so there is a Habs record of um, uh, the plan. Uh, interestingly, uh, what was also uh, removed was this, uh, in, in my opinion, rather distinctive 1940s streamlined modern glass storefront for Whitlow's which as I recall was in uh, two shades of vivid green, but um, I guess you can see that uh, they decided to return to the earlier facade uh, when um, restoring that. Uh, uh, then this, the, the fourth uh, episode I wanna talk about was the construction of the first convention center. So this involved um, a complete demolition of all the buildings on four city blocks uh, of course, today that convention center has been demolished and it's replaced by like the city center. But uh, back then you can see that uh, the character of, of the neighborhood was again, uh, late 19th century or early 20th century, largely uh, brick commercial and some residential buildings. Um, but because again of the preservation laws, there was an extensive photographic survey done of these four blocks prior to the demolition. Uh, and it, in fact, a couple of the buildings were considered distinguished enough that uh, they got standalone Habs treatment. So uh, again, this very handsome Beaux-Arts Elks Lodge built in 1908 that was on um, H Street. And then uh, Black Way and I Street was this Pepco power station by Arthur Heaton was the architect. He was an incredibly prolific 
uh, DC architect designed buildings all across the city, many of which were uh, industrial or transportation related. And I'll just quickly show two other buildings, uh, American Mosaic Company, uh, not particularly distinguished on the exterior, but it had several handsome uh, mantles, which I'm, were captured by Hav's photography. And then the Mount Vernon Theater, uh, which when it was demolished in 1979, was the last remaining Nickelodeon in DC. Um, so, and anyways, when I uh, started researching to do this presentation, I actually uh, went through the entire Habs collection for DC, over a thousand sites, and it was started, it was like going down a rabbit hole. I came across all kinds of stuff that I didn't know about, that I didn't know existed. And um, so there's all kinds of just totally random uh, buildings uh, in, in uh, the Habs collection, uh, a resource, uh, you can say a lot of different building types, um, you know, uh, all these buildings have been demolished, but uh, there's a record uh, here in the Habs collection. And actually, uh, I decided to uh, look at a couple of, of sites which I thought um, were perhaps more unusual, a little bit quirky. Um, and uh, these are uh, not sites that you'll find in, in the capital losses. Uh, so uh, I thought I found them to be rather interesting. So uh, these two buildings you see in the upper left were, were built uh, adjacent to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing at 15th and Independence. The architect was James Knox Taylor, who was the supervising architect of the Treasury. So uh, apparently at the time, the paper used to print money had uh, a very high linen content and the paper needed to be soaked in water for several days and then dried out before uh, it could be used. And so this building you see on the upper right was actually called the laundry uh, with this handsome uh, Spanish parapet. Uh, in any case, uh, <clears throat> you know, 80 years later, of course, this, this technique is long since obsolete. Uh, and these two buildings were demolished for the uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, another uh, quirky little building was the Girl Scout Tea House, which was out at the end of Haynes Point in what's now East Potomac Park. <clears throat> so the land of East Potomac Park uh, had been created when the Potomac was dredged in the 1890s. And, and at the time, uh, the land was under the jurisdiction actually of the US, the US Army. Uh, an agency known as the um, Office of Public Buildings and Grounds. Uh, in 1918, they paved the road out to the end of Haynes Point and back. Uh, today, it's known as Ohio Drive, but back then it was actually called the Speedway. And uh, so it was an attempt to get motorists, this is in the early days of motoring, uh, in their cars. And they decided they needed um, an objective for people to drive out to Haynes Point and back. And so they built this little building that was a combination of snack bar and comfort station. And the first year of its existence, it was actually run by the Girl Scouts. Uh, the army then took it away from them and gave it to a concessionaire, but it, it retained the name of the Girl Scout Tea House. So if we, again, if we cut ahead 60 years, uh, you can see on the right, uh, in 1985, uh, there was a major flooding along the Potomac River caused by Hurricane Juan. I personally remember uh, four feet of water on K Street in Georgetown. It was, it was really pretty remarkable. And uh, so all of Haynes Point, as you can see in this aerial photograph, was underwater. Uh, and of course, some people remember when the Awakening statue used to be in Haynes Point uh, before it got moved. Anyways, um, by this time, the land is under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service. Uh, the, the building had been vacant for about 20 years. The Park Service didn't have a use for it. It was damaged in the flood, and the Park Service didn't want to have spend money to restore it. So um, it was documented by Habs that had been demolished. Uh, uh, this certainly has to be one of the 
quirkiest buildings in the entire Hats collection, the, the film storehouse that was at uh, um, Fort McNair. Uh, so right at the end of World War I in 1918, uh, the Army decided to embrace the new technology of moving pictures and start making movies as training films uh, for uh, incoming soldiers. So at the time, uh, the film stock used in movies uh, was nitrate and it was highly flammable. And so the, the army was concerned that uh, if they had all their films stored in one place and a uh, fire broke out that they would lose uh, the whole collection. So they constructed this building which had nine individual vaulted individual vaults for storing the film. So if the fire broke out in one of the vaults, it would not spread to the others. You can see that each of these vaulted rooms was vented with a stack. Uh, of course, then uh, by the early 90s, this, again, this building was long since obsolete. Uh, the army was using it as a golf clubhouse, uh, but they really didn't want to continue maintaining it. Uh, here you can see the hallway with each of these individual vaulted rooms. And anyway, so it was demolished in, in 1992. And then, um, Engine Company 24 was located at the intersection of um, Georgia and New Hampshire avenues. Uh, so Metro was building the Green Line and they decided they wanted the site of the fire station for their station entry. Uh, the fire department brought, bought a new site about a mile up Georgia Avenue. <clears throat> and so uh, Metro demolished this building except for the facade which they moved to a different a corner at this intersection. And now it's the front of the chiller plant for the underground uh, metro station. So another case of facadism, the facade was preserved, although not in the original location, but the original interior, which you see on the photos on the right, uh, was is gone. Um, and I'd like to quickly wrap up with uh, three projects that I was personally involved in. Uh, this is uh, the Atlantic Building at 930 F Street, uh, one of DC's first skyscrapers in 1888, eight stories tall. Uh, again, another uh, facadism project. Um, you can see, uh, so it, it was documented by a uh, team in 1988. Uh, one of the Team members did a nice uh, rendering of the sign that was still over the doorway right here. Um, and lo and behold, it showed up on the developer's sign when uh, they demolished everything but the facade. Uh, and in fact, they demolished the facade uh, about in the late 90s and a recession hit and that the developer lost its funding. And so the facade stayed there for about three years, just. Uh, isolated uh, behind this scaffolding. Uh, in any case, uh, again, uh, yes, the facade was saved, but what was, what was lost was the interior of the building. Again, uh, a series of uh, offices on a double loaded corridor. Uh, again, a bunch of different indentations for light wells to bring light into the different offices. In fact, there were two enclosed light wells here that went all the way down the building on the inside. Uh, the shaft that was right here uh, in the building. Uh, you also notice each of the offices had a fireplace and the offices were also connected internally as well as to the corridor. Um, so you could rent a suite of offices uh, for your business. Uh, again, um, uh, an open stair that went all the way through the building and an open cage elevator. Uh, I should also point out in the early 1980s, this is where DCPL had their offices in the Atlantic building. Uh, you can see uh, on the left, the original stair running all the way up through the building. Uh, 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 the uh, open cage elevator would have been enclosed, but they removed the siding uh, when we did our HAPS documentation. But uh, the Atlantic building is probably best known for uh, on the ground floor in the back of the building, which was a large, originally a large banking hall, was of course the uh, original home of the famous 930 Club. Um, some of us are old enough 
uh, to admit we probably spent a few too many hours of our wayward youth listening to uh, some headbanging punk rock bands in that space. Uh, but I will uh, give a shout out to DCPL, who recently posted on their website um, a tour of the uh, uh, punk rock and go-go music scenes of the 1980s, uh, where this building features prominently. Uh, in, in, 19, in 2005, we were approached by DC's Office of Historic Preservation to document three buildings on the campus of St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Uh, St. E's, uh, if you haven't been there, is an, has an amazing collection of historic buildings. Um, by the early 20th century, it was really a self-contained village. Uh, St. E's raised all their own food, uh, and they had a, a herd of over 100 dairy cows. And so this uh, large, uh, substantial barn was built in 1894. Uh, it was 60 feet across by 120 feet deep. Um, and so there was a, a major daring operation going on here. Um, and so we documented that for uh, the Office of Historic Preservation. You can see the interior was this beautiful open space with this massive heavy timber construction. Uh, it's really uh, uh, pretty incredible. Uh, and then of course, uh, if you uh, uh, pay attention to the local news, just last December, um, a fire broke out and the building was completely destroyed. Uh, to my knowledge, there's only one barn left in the District of Columbia and that's the uh, barn, the Pierce barn at Pierce Mill in Rock Creek Park. So this is actually a very sad loss. And just quickly, um, I want to give another a shout out and thanks to DCPL, who uh, earlier this year put us in touch with the folks at Events DC, and we were able to get access to uh, RFK Stadium uh, to do a, a photography project, because uh, I'm sure as most of you know, it's scheduled to be demolished later this year. Um, I want to, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, give a shout out to uh, our two sister programs. So uh, here at HABS, we were actually a, a group of three programs. Um, the Historic American Engineering Record was established in 1969. Uh, as its name implies, they look at engineering and uh, um, industrial sites. Uh, this is the uh, United Clay Products Brickyard, um, which is part uh, it's on the grounds of the National Arboretum in Northeast. You might notice this when you drive out New York Avenue. Uh, so you can see these photos taken in the 70s. And then uh, I called it up on Google Earth last week, and you can see that most of these round brick kilns have been demolished down to the foundations. And as well, uh, these buildings, subsidiary buildings, have all been demolished also. Um, and our <clears throat> other uh, um, sister program, the Historic American Landscape Survey, uh, again, as its name implies, looks at uh, landscapes. So uh, on the right here, you have the plaza that was in front of um, the, this building, which houses the Department of Education on Maryland Avenue Southwest. Uh, it was a modernist landscape from 1961. It was demolished for the new uh, Eisenhower Memorial. Uh, then on the left, uh, so in 2006, the National Capital Region of the National Park Service approached us and asked us to do a photographic survey of some of the most important trees in the various national park units in, in uh, the DC area. Uh, this was the Farragut Square Ginkgo. It's thought to be uh, at least 140 years old, uh, a really a magnificent, beautiful tree. Uh, about 10 years later, uh, the Park Service hired a landscaping firm to come in and cut down a nearby tree that was dead. Uh, instead, they mistakenly cut this tree down, even though it was alive and thriving. And so, um, uh, uh, a very sad loss for people who love uh, beautiful big old trees. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our very good friends at the Library of Congress. Uh, they do an extraordinary job in maintaining and archiving the HAPS collection. 
Uh, the entire collection has been put online. You can go to their website. The collection is uh, copyright free. It's in the public domain. You can download any of the images and do whatever you want with them. It's an incredible resource. Uh, we do appreciate it if you give us credit, but uh, it's it's out there uh, for the American public to take advantage of. And uh, I'm going to end with this slide. Um, we transmit materials to the library four times a year. Uh, we just had a transmittal last month in February. Uh, as of that transmittal, you can see the numbers for the collection. Um, on the left, the total collection for the entire country and on the right, specific to the District of Columbia. Uh, this is one of the largest, if not the largest architectural archives in the United States. And I encourage everyone to uh, go to the website and start going down their own rabbit holes, to find all the amazing things that are in the Hans collection. And with that, I'm going to stop <laughs> and uh, answer any questions if there ha happen to be any. Such a wonderful presentation. I know uh, I've learned a lot. We've gotten uh, a few comments already about uh, what a great job <laughs> you've done, Mark. Uh, we do have a few questions. And um, if you're a participant and you have a question, please remember to put it into the Q&A and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, so our first question uh, is, is stated as the following. Uh, my observation is that DC has a lot more facadectomies than other big cities. Do you agree? And if so, do you have any idea why this is? Uh I do agree um, uh, why this is. Uh, one thing I've been told is that it has partly to do with the height limitation. Uh, you know, there's uh, pressure on real estate developers to maximize the building envelope, as it were, to, uh, you know, fill up as much space as they can. And um, by preserving the facade, uh, I guess they're, they, they feel like they're throwing a bone to the preservation community. Uh, I think, um, I, I, you know, could be wrong, but I, I, I think the preservation community in DC is, is getting away from this facade activity thing. And, um, it's getting a little more sophisticated about preserving whole buildings if they can. Great. Uh, what are the steps before a building gets documented? Um, and what is the on-site process of documentation uh, well, like? Well, yeah. Um, so um, uh, in the 1930s, which uh, I think was kind of the golden age of HABs, uh, those teams got to pick and choose what they wanted to document. Uh, today, uh, we typically don't have that. Um, you know, we, we have this really bare bones budget. Uh, uh, and so uh, basically all the projects which have, that we undertake in our own office uh, outside uh, government agencies or even the private sector comes to us, quite honestly with the money that it costs to do the documentation. So unfortunately we don't have the funding to undertake our own projects. Uh, I also mentioned the section 106, so a lot of documentation comes in through uh, requirements of that. Um, you know, um, we have an office of about 15 people. We have uh, architects, we have a couple of historians, we have two photographers. <clears throat> so uh, we literally go out uh, and uh, with the, off the projects we run ourselves, you know, like the, I showed the barn at St. E's and the, the um, uh, Atlantic building. Uh, and both of those projects I should mention were summer projects, which means, so in the summer, we continued this program of hiring college students uh, and we put them to work on uh, and measuring these buildings, then coming back to the office and, and uh, drawing them. Uh, everything's done on computer these days. Um, uh, we do a lot of, if you're familiar with the process of 3D laser scanning, uh, and then uh, the drawings are all executed in CAD. Um, <clears throat> although we still, we do a final set of printed materials of all our documentation to go to the library 
which uh, is what they consider to be their archive. Uh, I hope that answers the question in a nutshell. Yeah, great. Um, I know you mentioned the, the laser printing and a few other things, um, but we do have a question about, uh, are there any uh, technology advancements that might be uh, coming in building documentation? Well, certainly, uh, you know, when, uh, when I started in this, um, in this process, uh, all the measuring was done by hand with measuring tapes and line levels and all kinds of old fashioned gizmos and the drawings were done by hand and you would first decide what the scale was gonna be and you draw it up in pencil. Then we had what was called mylar, which is a sheet of plastic and you put it down on top of the pencil drawing and carefully trace it over with these ink technical pens. And that was the archival standard uh, 30 years ago. <clears throat> Again, we've gone totally computerized um, uh, we do all our drawing in CAD on the computer, uh, and um, we have several uh, digital techniques for capturing information, 3D laser scanning, what's known as photogrammetry. Uh, there's software out there. Um, <clears throat> you can even do this with your iPhone, although there's the question of accuracy, but you can you take a, a, a number of digital photographs and uh, there's enough overlap, overlap between the individual photos. There's software that will stitch them together and make a 3D model that then you can manipulate. So there's all kinds of new digital techniques out there that we're taking advantage of. And I should mention what drives a lot of the work we do is um, uh, different entities, they, they need digital uh, data to do facilities management. So um, people need CAD drawings, they need 3D models, so they can, um, you know, for ongoing maintenance uh, and, and preservation of these buildings. Very cool. Uh, have you heard of any buildings that have been raised um, that have been rebuilt using the HABs documentation? Uh, yes, there are actually some examples. Um, uh, uh, um, I, use, I, I give a version of this talk to student groups often because we have a big involvement with college students. Uh, a lot of uh, university programs teach measure drawings. Uh, but anyways, one of the sites I always show is um, St. Michael's Cathedral in Sitka, Alaska. Uh, this was built in, in the 1840s, uh, was the very first building documented by Habs in Alaska. It's considered you know, the most important historic building. It was documented in 1962. Uh, in 1966, a fire broke out and it burned to the ground. And so they took the Habs documents and did uh, a complete reconstruction of the building. So if you go to Sitka today, uh, St. Michael's is there and it looks exactly like the original, although uh, instead of rebuilding it in wood, it was actually rebuilt in concrete and then sheathed in wood so that they didn't want it to burn again, which, and, which was understandable. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, we have another question about uh, this arch that you have pictured here. Uh -huh, right. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, that was, <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was that year's folk life festival. Uh, typically they feature a foreign country and that year it was Mali and they brought in some craftsmen from Mali and they built what was this, supposed to be a traditional, uh, Adobe Malian, Malian arch. And it was up for the, um, about a month during the folk life festival. And then, uh, actually, um, since it was on the mall, which is, uh, uh, you know, jurisdiction of the Park Service, the director of the Park Service asked us to photograph it before it was demolished because it was considered such a distinctive um, um, construction. Yeah, is there a reason why they demolished it instead of they just didn't want to put it anywhere else? Well, it sat right in the middle of the wall. Uh, I think you would, to move it, because it, it's Adobe, you, you couldn't really, yeah. you'd have to demolish it in order to mm -hmm. move it. So um, it was always intended to be temporary. But um, it, it was, a, I, I think, a rather beautiful structure. Yeah, I agree. 
Well, I think those are all of our questions. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending and Mark for this great uh, presentation. Uh, we'll be sending out the link with, with the recording. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can just respond to the email that we sent uh, earlier this morning. So that is, that's all, folks. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, it was my pleasure, really. So. All right, great. Well, have a great day, everyone. Okay. <clears throat>